The next point that we're going to talk about is about energy and how it can be released and absorbed in order to either make or break bonds. And we're going to talk about this in terms of how matter can change state. We know that generally the three main states are solids, liquids and gases. And matter can exist at one of these three states at a particular temperature. But pressure is also something that uh, can influence that. The state of the matter depends on the strength of these intramolecular or intermolecular forces present. So the stronger the strength of those uh, forces, then the greater the likelihood that we can find it in possibly a solid or even a liquid state. So this has direct uh, influences on melting and boiling points. Again, we'll see this in a moment. So we've got an example of uh, a substance that can exist in three different states. And we could talk for uh, water as an example. We know that water exists as a solid, which we call ice, as a liquid, just what we call liquid water or just water, and then a gas, which uh, we can call vapour or steam. What we know is that we actually have to put in energy in order to take particles of water as a solid and convert it into a liquid, further add more energy to convert the liquid into a gas. And as we do that, what we see are differences in terms of the energy of the particles within there. In a solid, it generally has a, a relatively fixed uh, shape because the particles don't move around and vibrate very much. As we add more energy, those particles gain more energy, they gain more kinetic energy and therefore can move around a lot more, and therefore the structure is less ordered. So those particles can move around a little bit more freely. Once we provide it with even more energy, then those particles can gain enough so that they spread themselves out and they can almost just move independently of one another and they end up forming a gas. We could do the opposite, so to convert a gas to a liquid we can just look at removing energy and that energy would just be removed from the surroundings. So we can convert the gas to a liquid, a liquid to a solid by removing that energy itself. So when we talk about changes of state, we can actually talk about them in terms of endothermic and exothermic processes. In an endothermic process, we require an overall input of energy to try and uh, change these states of matter from one to the other. So an input of energy is required from the surroundings. And we would need this when we need to, for example, convert a solid to a liquid and a liquid into a gas. So convert ice into liquid water, and then liquid water into steam. An exothermic process overall requires an output of energy to the surroundings. So this means that heat energy is given off when a substance changes from a gas to a liquid, and then a liquid back into a solid. The last point that we're going to talk about in this video is looking at how we can use different physical properties to help classify materials according to their bonding and their structure. So melting points can actually be used to classify materials into molecular and non-molecular lattices. And then also the electrical conductivity, in particular of non-molecular materials, helps provide evidence for three types of bonding. So we've got metallic, ionic and covalent. So if we are given some data, we would need to be able to classify the materials as one of these uh, particular types of bonding, as well as look at structures being molecular or lattice. So if we start off with the melting point, and we can start off by talking about the bonding. So if we have metallic bonding, what we know is that metallic um, bonding results in lattice structures. And metallic bonding, which is a type of primary bond, we know is a very strong bond. It's a, an intramolecular bond. So we would predict that the melting point for any metallic substance with metallic bonding to be high. If we go to the next one, an ionic uh, substance containing ionic bonding is also uh, made up of a lattice structure. The forces between the particles is going to be strong again, and we can also expect the melting point to be high. The next one, and this is what we call a continuous covalent compound or a substance or element, uh, in this case, it has 
consistent or continuous covalent bonding between all of the atoms. And it happens in a lattice structure. So we can expect the forces between these particular atoms, again, to be strong. And these often are very, very strong. So the melting point ends up being high to very high. The last one is where it can differ. And so in this case, this is where you have covalent bonding. But those atoms exist as molecules. So the structure is molecular. We said that the forces between the molecules is actually weak, what we refer to as intermolecular forces. So therefore, our melting point is going to be low. We're going to look at just two examples here. So I've got sodium chloride and benzoic acid. So these are the names of the two compounds here. We're just going to compare these one property at a time. So firstly, we're going to talk about the bonding and the structure. So we can see that for sodium chloride, NaCl, which is made up of sodium and chlorine, both the metal and a non-metal, we know that, that therefore will exhibit ionic bonding. And we know that all substances with ionic bonding will have lattice structures. Benzoic acid, on the other hand, is made up of only non-metal atoms. So that's going to exhibit covalent bonding. Benzoic acid molecules uh, essentially form, so they will have a molecular form or molecular structure. If we use this information, we can then look at the strength uh, of attraction between the particles. So sodium chloride with its strong ionic bonding is going to be quite strong. In terms of benzoic acid, because we are dealing with molecules, then the forces between molecules is generally seen as weak because these are the weaker intermolecular forces. And so finally, if we look at comparing uh, melting points, we would expect that sodium chloride to have a high melting point and benzoic acid to have a low melting point. And we can see that using this data here. It's important that we can look at this because sometimes substances can actually appear the same. So we can see that both of these appear as white crystalline solids. So we can use the physical properties to help predict things like the structure and the bonding for a particular material. If we finally talk about electrical conductivity, and uh, we'll start off by just mentioning how we can get uh, substances to conduct electricity. The materials themselves require charged particles that can actually freely move around and to conduct electricity. So when we do apply a voltage across the circuit, those freely moving charged particles should be able to move and carry the charge or carry that flow of charge through the circuit itself. If it can't do that, it means the substance cannot conduct electricity. Again, what we're going to do is look at how the type of bonding, uh, again, influences the structure. This then allows us to see whether there are any potential charge carriers or not, and therefore whether it can conduct electricity. So if we start off uh, with metallic bonding, again, we know that it has a lattice structure. In this specific case, what we have are freely moving electrons, uh, which is freely moving charge. And because we have that, we can get electrical conductivity. We know metals are generally good conductors of electricity. The next one, and we're going to look at this in three ways. Firstly, looking at ionic bonding. Firstly, as a solid, we know it has a lattice structure. And in this case, we actually don't have any freely moving charge. Ionic uh, compounds contain uh, positively and negative, negatively charged particles called ions. But the problem is that they can't actually freely move around. And because of that, it means that we can't get any electrical conductivity, or at least it's going to be very, very low. If we then heat this up to convert it into a liquid, we still do have ionic bonding present, but we no longer have this lattice structure because we've heated it to the point where these ions are free to move around. So in our case here, we do have these freely moving charge carriers, and these are the names of the ions. The negatively charged ions are called anions, the positively charged ions are called cations, and with this freely moving charge, we can get electrical conductivity. The final case in terms of ionic compounds is if it's in aqueous solution. 
and this means that it is dissolved in water. We know that water can be an effective solvent and it can help dissolve things like ionic compounds. So we're going to end up with a similar case. So even though water is present, we still do have freely moving ions. Those would consist of both of those anions and cations. And again, we'd expect high conductivity here. The last two refer to covalent bonding. So the first one's continuous covalent bonding. In terms of the structure, we do have a lattice structure. We don't usually have any charge carriers. The only exception in this case are things like graphite and graphene, but generally speaking, continuous covalent structures don't actually conduct electricity. So in this case, we would normally expect there to be low conductivity, with the exception of graphite and graphene. The final type of bonding, again, is covalent, but it's in the form of molecular structures. And in this specific case, we actually don't have any charge carriers, so anything to carry that uh, charge across from uh, uh, throughout the circuit itself. So we, again, we'd expect to have low conductivity. The star indicates that there are a few exceptions, and those exceptions refer to acids. But this is something that we will talk about in a later time. So that concludes my video on 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, don't forget to like my video and subscribe to my channel for more videos on chemistry. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.